Why the 45th president of the United States, Donald Trump, is yet to concede defeat at the November 3rd presidential election, Israel, Saudi Arabia, India join world leaders in congratulating Joe Biden and Harris. And in Nigeria, Senate President Ahmed Lawan warns that Nigeria may be at the brink of another youth protest if it fails to tackle unemployment. This is Lost Politics. I am Coyote Ladeini. Welcome back. This is Plots Politics. Barely a week after the U.S. election and four days after President Donald Trump still refused to concede victory to the now president-elect Joe Biden, Saudi Arabia's King Salman bin Abdulaziz and his son, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, and Sunday joined other Arab countries in congratulating President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris on their election victory. He is not alone. Only yesterday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu congratulated Biden and Harry, saying via Twitter, Joe, we've had a long and warm personal relationship for nearly 40 years. Germany, Israel, India, among others, are among countries aligning to the Joe Biden and Harry's victory. The question is, what are the implications of these, especially as Trump is yet to concede defeat? Joining us to discuss this virtually, uh, exactly via Zoom, as a strategy consultant for NOVA. NOVA stands for Non-Violence for African Development and is also the special advisor to Khan President Shukbo Ayokunle on conflict resolution and terrorism. I'm referring to Reverend Ladi Thompson. Good evening, Reverend. Good evening. Yeah, and good to have you. The pleasure of holiday is always mine. Okay, let's start with um, what the media has described as projected winner of the U.S. election. And uh, the world leaders are not waiting at all. Uh, in fact, in Nigeria here, we saw Olusha Gobasanjo even sent this message before we had our president. And quite a lot of people have started, you know, pouring congratulatory message to uh, the president-elect. I think the one interesting one is Netanyahu, whom we know how Trump, you know, stood by him, described him as his our friend. This is someone who moved the capital from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And you know the old story. What do you really think? Is this a case of abandonment or it is just diplomacy as we always call it? Danny, let me tell you, what you are seeing at play is the fact that behind the screen, practically all global leaders maintain some form of communication or the other across most of these axes. So when you see that rash of uh, congratulatory messages at a time when, if we speak the truth, uh, the elections are yet to be really concluded, speaking truthfully. What you are seeing is a result of the back end of meetings that have been held in the quiet. And it tells you that uh, the world has become a global village. And um, I would like to say to you point blank, what you are seeing is a concerted effort by global leaders to influence American politics. Okay, when you talk about what you're seeing, uh, I, I want to understand it purely, you know, just like you said. A, a lot of people will say that, um, what are we expecting? Are we expecting some kind of romance between the United States and the Arab world? And um, what are we expecting? Even Iran even said that they, they, they're looking at uh, some of these... Uh, a frosty relationship they have with U.S. coming to an end with a new president. So 
Are we seeing a situation where U.S. will go back and, um, you know, have some kind of relationship with Iran? Let's start with that. Okay, let, let's look at it like this. First of all, let's not forget that, practically speaking, America is the last surviving, quote, world power, as it were. And their influence has been very far-reaching across the world. Nobody ever expected the profile of a Donald Trump to become president of America. And so the quantity that Donald Trump brought to the presidency in America, to the White House, was something that the globe could hardly cope with. The degree of unorthodoxy that Donald Trump brought to the table was something that made a whole lot of people very, 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 very uncomfortable. If you remember what he did to NATO, shook up NATO, the WHO, the UN, you name it. Now, upsetting, he upset the global balance in more ways than anybody has ever done in the past half a century. So what you see there that is happening is that many of these nations were bewildered. They really didn't know what to expect. They didn't know what to turn to. Uh, you mentioned Iran. Iran's deadly opponent was being backed by Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump was unpredictable, and Donald Trump was a leader that many of these nations simply had to reckon with because he was occupying the seat of, quote, the most powerful man in global politics. So when you see these responses and reactions, these are bottled up emotions that all along had been there because of this unknown quantity that just appeared and took up the seat of the most powerful man in the world who had the nuclear codes at his fingertips that, listen to me, could obliterate many nations from the face of this earth at his own call. Now, what didn't make things easy for many of those nations was the fact that Donald Trump was less of a president and more of a monarch. Mm -hmm. So what they saw, they could not cope with. And I can tell you point blank right now that um, officially speaking, it is not over till it's over. And so this rush of... Uh, Congratulatory messages is the global community speaking up and saying, look, America, trash Trump. We've had enough of him. Hmm. But, but look, can we make it a bit more um, uh, practical now? Because I remember his mantra while he was coming into power the first time. He would say, America first, America first. And we saw that played out in, the, in his economic plan, how he was... You know, he fought China tooth and nail, tried to get them out of America. And people would say, to a large extent, the unemployment rate dropped as low as 3%. That is before the COVID now. So if we look at it, are we saying that that policy was counterproductive in the real sense or just continue to be the big brother of the world while your country suffers? Reviewing its policy now. Well, you see, um, when it comes to global leadership, we need to be very careful because when America sneezes, many nations will catch a cold. And once your nation has gotten to that kind of level and that kind of point in global politics, it is practically suicidal for you to make a 180-degree turn and then decide that you just want to focus on America only. Now, that might have even worked, but behind that make America great again message, there were also some hidden agenda that Donald had. Now, let me tell you some of the American uh, politics at that level. Never be deceived. Behind every presidential candidate, you have an Amada or an army of special advisors. 
You have people who have written papers. You are seeing, we are going to see their publications. You're going to find out that there are a lot of professionals, a lot of consultants who run scenarios. And what looks stupid on the surface many a time is actually not stupid, but the product of a whole lot of consultation. Now, what um, Donald Trump had done effectively in America was that he had stocked up something that America was trying to bury. You see, for us in Africa here, we may not have felt the heat as much as for the minorities in America. What uh, Trump had promised his base, the base he was playing to, and based on his calculations for his victories, he had calculated that if he could get the quote white vote, he would make it every time. So his ploy worked. He went after the white vote. The white vote worked for him. But the supremacist tendencies of the white versus black dynamic in racism had reared up its head in America. And you see, that was not palatable because the moral state of the nation had gone down. Now, this is very interesting because he had been accepted by the evangelicals as the <laughs> Christian candidate who was the one who was to repair the breach in American politics. <laughs> but the challenges that we have there is that when you look into the character profile of Donald Trump, the, it's, it, 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 it's very interesting because his character profile does not sell as a, as a Christian candidate or not even as an, a religious you know, exemplar in any way. So what you had packed into one person was a series of contradictions that made it difficult for anybody really to be able to second guess or to understand what was sitting on the throne in America. So for the white supremacists, for the whites who are feeling threatened, and uh, for the, the, those who remember the earlier days of uh, slavery, those who still have the memories of, uh, you know, uh, separate but equal, and many who are pushed back. If you remember Bull Connors, Martin Luther King Jr. and all that, you would realize that he had revived a sentiment in America that would have been better left hmm. buried. Okay. And that was dangerous because it had sparked a wave of nationalism across the entire world. I, I, I'm, 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 if you I'm, watch out very well, what was happening in America was affecting many other nations of the world. And the supremacist and racist sentiments were already rising all over the world. And that's why many of the leaders across the world knew that, morally speaking, there was no way they would wish for another four years of a Donald Trump. For us in Nigeria, I can tell you something. If you ask me as a Nigerian and ask me as an African that who would have been a better president for us, for our policies here, despite his racism in America, Trump is good for Africa. Why? He's an orthodox. Why do I say Trump is good for Africa? Are you going to say that you, you don't understand Trump? What is Trump doing in America that our own politicians don't do here? <laughs> Look, short of shooting guns and capturing ballots on election day, <laughs> Reverend, nothing Reverend, that Trump was uh, doing, that, whether it's that, that was quite, girlfriends, that was, wives, uh, youth, Okay, Reverend, jo Reverend Thompson, that was quite ironic. I was going to think that um, uh, you were going in the direction of um, being seen as, you know, because this actually caused a whole lot of cyber warfare between, um, among Christians. We see a whole lot of them saying that, oh, this man, his, his style is very pro-evangelicals. We've seen all manner of dramas that even led to people having serious, you know, tempers flaring. But Let's look at this critically, since you're a reverend and you help us do justice to it. Now, some of the things people, the, the supporters of the pro-Trump mention is the fact that, oh, this is a man who brought back happy Christmas and not happy holiday. This is a man who vehemently stood against Islamic terrorists. This is a man who, you know, identifies and really blacklists some other religion. So I, I'm looking at 
to what extent do people get carried away or, you know, got to the extent that we even saw people leading protests here in Nigeria saying Trump is going to come back? <laughs> well, I think you need to allow Nigerians to... To relax. Uh, ...express and vent, you know, whatever frustrations are in them. Like I said to you, um, the conditions of living in Nigeria are very tough. <laughs> so sometimes to let us steam, there are quite a number of Nigerians who fantasize that they are Americans. <laughs> so they actually get involved more in the American elections than, than they get involved with Nigerian elections. So I don't think there's anything with people letting up steam. Where there may be a challenge is this, and you forgot to mention that Trump is the only unorthodox American president who will dare to look at uh, President Muhammad Buhari and ask him the most undiplomatic question in this world, making an insin insinuation that, that he killing Christians. did not really substantiate, but based on reports coming in and actually the lobbies that were going on in America, he pinned down the Nigerian president and asked him not why is your security apparatus not working? That was not his question. He asked him a question, why are you killing Christians hmm. in Nigeria? Now, that kind of orthodoxy is bound to excite the religious uh, front. But let me speak to you as um, a person who is on the inside of the Christian faith. Uh, what Trump has done is, on the surface, very exciting, for people who have not yet really understood the depths of the mandate mission and the message of Jesus Christ. It actually is an abdication. You see, it is the church that is meant to be the salt and the light. It's the church that is meant to be taking, making sacrifices. It's the church that is meant to set the moral tone, moral standards. It's the church that's supposed to be help, helping everybody, Christians and non-Christians alike, to make progress in any nation. So what we see there was an abdication on the part, I would venture, of the American church. There were lots of things that the American church had a strong desire for, but their people lacked the courage, they lacked the organization, to get out there and, you know, get into what it takes, the, the tensions, the struggles, to bring these results. Now, lo and behold, here comes a smart politician who reads the church and reads the mood of the church and says, you know what? What you're looking for, I can give you. Nobody else will dare, but I would if you put your base behind me. And as far as Trump is really concerned, if you listen to Trump very well and you have ever listened to him, uh, National Day of Prayer, listen to the interviews when the church uh, would interview him, there were many slips he made that make you that make it very clear to you that he's not a man who reads the Bible. <laughs> now he's not a man who even studies scripture. In fact, there was a question he was once asked that uh, does he ever have a room to repent when he sins and all that? And Trump was very frank when he was telling them that look, he doesn't look back. So when he makes mistakes, he moves forward. He doesn't sit down, money mm -hmm. nobody. And the person in the interview kept trying to say, well, so do you repent? Do you come unto the Lord and all that? And Trump kept saying, no, no, no. Uh, Trump, his profile is that of a positive thinker. Mm -hmm. So he debunked. In practical terms, everybody knew that if Trump is a Christian at all, at best, he's a baby Christian. Okay. Let, Speaking uh, from the perspective of the faith. Reverend, because of time, let me just take so this last an question. application on behalf of church leadership that Okay, let me quickly ask this question because of uh, this probably might be the last question. You touched a part of it, and uh, I want you to dwell more mm -hmm. on it. Uh, people would say, what is the need for Africa in terms of, um, you know, the most populous nation and, and, mm -hmm. in, in black community, Nigeria? You saw the president, and I could decode, even from the tone of his message, he's really looking forward to Joe Biden's uh, presidency. How strategic and how, why should we even be excited in the first place? Because there is this argument that we should not even wait for another form of neocolonialism for us to fix our country. So what exactly are we 
expecting from Biden's presidency? Well, I think, um, frankly speaking, Nigeria is suffering from a lot of delusions. <laughs> We're a nation that is totally dependent on the whims and the caprices of nations like America. Whatever semblance of peace we think we have, whatever economic progress that we think we make, honestly, these are things that are discussed in meetings outside of this country. We may be on paper the giants of Africa, but the amount of thinking that is required to make us really occupy those positions is yet to be undergone. Hmm. So in all ramifications, Nigeria produces so little and in terms of leadership, they are watching us because if we would ever rise, we become a strong factor in Africa. Mm. So if you ask me, I will tell you something that the only reason why uh, a Biden win would be exciting Nigeria right now is because the pressure that um, a Trump represents because of the Christian lobby and his choice to uphold the Christian religious agenda will not work for a section of the rulership of this country. Let's not forget that we are still in the center of a war against terrorism. Let us not forget that we have service chiefs who are serving a president. And when we look at the results that we are getting on ground in, in Nigeria here, we are not exactly winning the war against terror. It will be a delusion. If we look at the whole of northern Nigeria right now, we can see the amount of destabilization that has gone on. Muslims are being killed as well. If we look at the infiltration factor, in fact, Nigeria is a terrorized country. Hmm. So all these things are just escape valves because sooner or later, we're going to have to roll up our sleeves, okay. face our problems squarely, and realize that salvation cannot come. Handouts can come from America hmm. or from any other nation. But trust me, Salvation will not come from neither America, nor China, nor Russia, hmm. or any of the, you know, nations that have surplus Thank until you. we, you know, get going, get our act together and decide to become the real giant of Africa that we were created to be. To be. Thank you so much, Reverend Ladi Thompson. That was a wonderful way to end this conversation. You ended it as a strategist. You ended it as a reverend. And I want to say thank you so much to you. We hope that our leaders will take this as a big lesson and let us look inward to fix our own internal issues. Thank you once again. Pleasure has been mine. Thank you, Gary. Yeah. And to our viewers, thank you for staying with us. But it's not over yet. We'll take a short break now. And when we return... Is second wave of NSAS protests imminent? Please find out. We'll be back after this short break. <laughs>